by the time you were in the middle 70s, um, it was well proven that being creative and taking some risks could pay off. Right, obviously. <laughs> Both with an audience, if you're a radio station, or an artist, if you're a singer-songwriter. Mm -hmm. um, so was KMPX your first experience with uh, Freeform Radio? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Did you I knew who Tom Donahue was because okay. my grandparents lived in Oakland, and so I spent a lot of time in the Bay Area mm -hmm. going early high school. And so here, I have said I listened to KXOA in Sacramento a lot. In the Bay Area, there was um, KFRC and KYA, and um, so, biggies, yeah. <laughs> so being aware of Donahue, and Donahue it's something had, I was already aware Donahue of. Donahue had come from Top 40 Radio, but he burned out on it. And right. Do you think he was the architect of Freeform? Yeah, I really do. Okay. He, he, he had the clout to put the idea to practice. Other people might have had the idea more or less simultaneously, right about that same time. He ended up getting a chunk of time, and I think it was in the evening at the beginning, okay. um, to play album tracks. Um, and so it was catching on in San Francisco. And also, coincidentally, in San Francisco about this time, there were bands like the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane, and yeah. um, they were starting to make waves musically. So all of a sudden, here was an outlet. No, they didn't have record contracts, but there's tape out there. Mm -hmm. So we heard the airplane on tape. We heard, I remember, I heard Creedence Clearwater do I Put a Spell on You long before the record ever came out because mm -hmm. Campy X played the tape okay. over and over again. So, so they introduced to me, he, he's, he's yeah. given general credit for creating that, and I agree okay. with creating what's called freeform or progressive or mm -hmm. what are all the underground underground <laughs> that's another one yeah. for that kind of radio right luckily we were far enough away from san francisco not to compete mm -hmm. with them so the proximity made it easy to get to know some of these people how did you get to know tom donahue well the first time i ever talked to him i called camp x to make a request i was a college student at foothill college in Pal near palo alto and he answered the phone. I never expected that, and I just... What shift did he do, afternoon? He was, this was an evening oh, show, okay. and I called to hear something, and he answered the phone, and he had that voice that is so dramatic that I started stammering. I couldn't make sense out of what I wanted to say. <laughs> um, that was the first time I talked to him, you know, and that led to a high point a couple years later of him introducing me when I did a fill-in shift at KSAM. Uh, the all-night guy got sick and nobody could fill in, and I happened to be partying with the program director. He looked at me and said, do you want to go on KSAP tonight? Wow. Sure. I was still at KSAP at the time. Yeah. There was no conflict of interest right. or any kind of competitive issue. So, sure. Mm -hmm. So, I followed Tom Donahue, Tom and Rachel wow. uh, at midnight one night, and I have it on tape. Great. That's awesome. Um, and just over the years before Tom died, okay. once I got involved in KZAP, was always involved in promotions that took place in San Francisco. So mm -hmm. the KSAN staff and Donahue and the KZAP staff that included me at that time would end up being invited to the same things, like rock shows and dinners and promotional parties, record release things um, in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So hanging out with these people gave me an opportunity to get to know them. I considered my sphere of activity and involvement to include the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. The record companies, were, keep in mind, they were breaking out of this mold and this habit of dealing with top 40 stations. Right. So if you didn't have numbers, if you didn't have ratings, if you didn't generate the revenue, then they would take less interest in you because yeah. you could do less for them. Right. I mean, what's a station with you know 100 people that listen? They're not going to sell 100 albums. They might sell one <laughs> if, if they're lucky. Yeah. So. The economics, the math, the business side of things was, was involved in that. But mm -hmm. as the stature of KZAP grew, the more recognition we got from record companies. Mm -hmm. The first time I was on the air at KZAP was the night of the first anniversary party, which was the Grateful Dead at Cal Expo. Right. Nobody wanted to be on the air. Everybody wanted to go to the show. Okay. Well, I wanted to go to the show, too, but I... Uh -huh. 
I like to think I was smart enough to realize this was my opportunity, oh, so I yeah. took it, and I ended up on the air. Nobody heard me because they were all at the, <laughs> nobody nobody from the station heard yeah, me okay. because they were all at the show. But it didn't matter because it, people weren't judged. But in, the, in my gather, people weren't judged on their on air uh, whatever they did on the air, you know, as they would today, where they bring you, you were, set you aside, and say, "No, you can't do that." Right. You were judged by your musical knowledge okay. and your ability to put it together. Whether you spoke in complete sentences was far less important. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and there were times that, depending on the circumstance, there were more incomplete sentences delivered than complete sentences in the right. course of an evening. And it was two turntables, right? Yeah. So yeah, we didn't did have a backup. Did you use any kind of tape at all? <clears throat> yeah. Like carts or anything? Well, we used cart, carts for spots. Carts for some songs if we needed to. High rotation type. <laughs> no, it had nothing to do with the word rotation. It had right. to do with rarity. It had oh, to okay. do with, well, maybe we were given this, maybe the record guy brought an acetate in and had to take it with him. Oh, okay. Because he had to take it to the real radio station right. down the street. So it. we'd have to dub it off. So yeah. there's a reason to have something on tape. Yeah. Um, also to make echo. Oh, okay. That was real cool. Okay. That started at KERS. Okay. When Wardell and I would end up doing these amazing sets with, keep in mind, very early Pink Floyd and Moody Blues and classical music and blending it together and mm -hmm. throwing a little echo on there. It's amazing. The, different echoes you get at the different speeds of the tape. Mm -hmm. We were all just playing around. Right. Yeah. It was almost like a college station, huh? Like K's app. Yeah, it was a lot like a college station. How was it different from KERS? Um, you got paid a little bit. <laughs> right. Not much, yeah. not much at all. There were two or three places around downtown Sacramento that were known as K's app houses. Um, where a bunch of us would rent a house and all live together and communally eat and mm -hmm. share bicycles and maybe somebody had a car. Um, was that walking distance to Kazak? It was bike riding distance. Oh, okay. at, at, yeah, you could walk. Mm -hmm. um, ninth, and, ninth and J to 23rd and N, oh, not yeah, very far. No problem. Not very far at all. Yeah. 